that, uh, that would be wonderful as well. Would you bow your heads with me as we uh, transition to this part of our service? God in heaven, we just give you all honor and glory today. We praise and uplift your name, Father. We want uh, your name to be honored in this place. So God, uh, thank you that we have this opportunity to bask in your presence. Speak to us through your word, and uh, may we hear your spirit here today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lessons learned is, uh, is the, the title of my, my message today. Lessons learned uh, kind of connects uh, informally with last week's message. And so I want to begin, as is my tradition, by uh, interacting with the young people here in the church. And we have a little bit of a thing called a kid's quiz. And so if you would like to participate, just raise your hand and I'll call on you and love to have you involved. So hopefully... Uh, the, the questions will ring true with you today. Who learned, and th uh, this is all going to be about lessons learned, Mitch, okay? Who learned that fig leaves will not hide them from God? Who learned that? I know Pastor Zach raised his hand. By the way, I was going to ask, did you notice in the video when they talked about the kids channel that the guy that was presenting, he was in a bow tie? I'm seeing that that's kind of more the invo. Pastor Zach, do, am I out of touch? Do I need to get a bow tie in order for young people to really, uh, it's becoming a thing. And uh, so I, I may need to update my attire here and, and get that going or else it just won't work. Um, I've always said that neckties are women's revenge for high heels anyways, but... Um, who learned that fig leaves will not hide them from God? Pastor Zach knows, but I want to see if any of the, the young people know. You remember this one? Who tried to hide themselves with fig leaves? Toby? Eve and Adam. Eve and Adam, that is correct. After they sinned, they ran, and they thought that they could hide themselves, cover their shame, cover their nakedness, but uh, God called them out, and uh, that didn't work out so good. Who learned that lying about his wife to Pharaoh will only get him into trouble? Who lied about his wife uh, and uh, got in trouble with Pharaoh? All right, Jacob? You got it right. That's Abram or Abraham. He says, yeah, she's not my wife. She's my sister. Please don't hurt me. I'm okay. And uh, actually, it was a problem for Pharaoh, too. Um, but uh, Abraham had to learn a lesson there. Who learned that running from his problems does not solve them? And we could use a lot of Bible characters for this because a lot of people ran from God. But here's a hint. He ran from his blind father, from his twin brother, his father-in-law, and from others. I saw Ryan's hand go up. Leah, we'll catch you here another time. Ryan. You got it right, Jacob, and he's also called Israel after he wrestles from God. He had to learn a lot of lessons in his life. Jacob is a fascinating guy to study in the Bible, and we're blessed to have so many stories to learn from. Who learned that his great strength could be taken away with a pair of skizzers? All right, I'm going to go to this side. I, Leah, I didn't see your hand. Oh, oh, Caleb. I, can I give Caleb a shot, Gabby? I appreciate that. Caleb, what do you got for us? Can you say it? Is, is that right? Samson? If I say it in the Spanish and with the, the inflection there. Samson, yes. Very good. Thank you, Caleb. You got it. What a story that is. Another amazing character. Okay, last one. Last one, all right? We're all about learning lessons here today. Who learned that he had to keep his eyes on Jesus when walking on water? And I've got to give Gabby a shot here. He, he'll probably get it wrong, though. You know, we'll come over here. Gabby, what do you say? Oh, he said Peter. What did you say, Gloria? Yeah, see, they both know it. So credit goes all around. Very good. You guys are right. Yeah, so many lessons learned. I had a... Uh, a friend asked me just this week um, about whether or not we as a culture, we as a community will commemorate March 11th in our uh, historical analysis. Will March 11th be a major date that we remember as a world and as a community? So March 11th, if you're already kind of like, what is March 11th? I don't even know what you're talking about. That was the official day in 2020 that the World Health Organization officially declared that COVID-19 was a global pandemic. 
So it's just kind of a way mark. It's kind of a, now it, it was probably a pandemic before then, but that, that was the date that they said, we now have enough evidence. And by our estimation, we are declaring this a global pandemic. And uh, it's been a, an amazing year uh, for our culture, for our world, for our country. And, and so my friend just kind of asked the question, will March 11 be a major milestone? Uh, I don't think it will be just simply because I'd forgotten about it. It doesn't really, uh, 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 you know, there's been a lot of other major events that have come and gone, and we don't always remember the dates. Of course, most of us remember September 11th, you know, September 11th, um, 2001. Uh, another major one, December 7th. You know what that one is? Okay, 1941. Uh, one that's related to that, June 6th. You remember what June 6th is? 1944? Okay, sometimes we need the year to go with it, right? Um, let's see. Uh, how about November 22nd? November 22nd, 1963. How many of you remember where you were at on November 22nd? You may not always remember the day, but you remember the event. Uh, how about January 28th? January 28th, 1986. Challenger. I was five years old. I don't remember physically, I don't remember it, but I know that we were watching it at home because I remember my mom crying. And that moment of my mother crying is locked in my head. And um, so no, uh, uh, January 28th. How about April 4th? April 4th, 1968. MLK. The assassination of MLK. How about July 16th? Your wedding? <laughs> Was it in 1969? <laughs> July 16, 1969. Even you glued to your televisions when Neil Armstrong came down on the lunar module and put his feet on the moon. Um, how about November 9th? November 9th? More recent history, 1989. I remember this day very well. The Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall was officially no longer a barrier enforced by the Soviet government, and the unification of Germany began after November 9, 1989. Will we commemorate March 11? What can we learn from these things? That's kind of the question that I want to pose to you. I love history. I do. Um, and it's just fascinating to me. It doesn't come natural to everyone. A lot of people's eyes glaze over, and they, let's not talk about, you know, all these things, and let's not talk about disco or anything, because it just gets crazy. Um, I love history. I think we learn so much. I have a, a quote from you from Mrs. White. Miss, many of you have probably heard this before. It's a, a slightly longer quote, but there's a portion in it that you probably know by heart. The work is soon to close. The members of the church militant who have proved faithful, will become the church triumphant. By the way, if you like word searches, or, or if you like to look in Mrs. White's writings and you can have the search engine, look up her, the, the phrase church militant. She just really has a lot of neat things to say about the church in that context. She's not talking about uh, aggressive violence, by the way. She's talking about the active church, the church that's struggling uh, with, uh, with the world um, today. In reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God. As I have seen what God has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. We are now a strong people if we will put our trust in the Lord, for we are handling the mighty truths of the Word of God. We have everything to be thankful for. I like that phrase. We have everything to be faithful. Uh, thankful for if we walk in the light as it shines upon us from the living oracles of God we shall have large responsibilities corresponding to the great light given to us by God we have many duties to perform because we have been made the depositories of sacred truth to be given to the world in all its beauty and all its glory we are debtors to God to use every advantage he has entrusted to us to beautify the truth of holiness of character and to send the message of warning and of comfort of hope and love to those those who are in the darkness of error 
and sin. I know that was a little bit of a long quote to read before you, um, but I wanted to give the full context of this part that we, uh, who've been in the church for a while, we know so well. that This part that says we have nothing to fear for the future except what? If we don't learn from the past. And that's, by the way, one of the greatest problems of our church and our culture right now is we're not learning from the past. And we're doing exactly the same things that many of our ancestors and forefathers did before us in their insanity of of divisive politics and divisive behavior. This is part of the human condition. This is part of sin that prevents us from learning from the past. Life is about learning, right? Right? Everything we do, even our mistakes, I, I, I don't mean to, uh, to always bring my family into this, but Timory is learning to drive right now, she, you know, and you all remember what it's like to learn to drive, and she feels bad when she makes a mistake, and I keep saying, don't look at it as a bad thing, look at it as a, as a learning thing, right? Even when you do poorly on a test or you do poorly at something, you can get down on yourself, but look at it as an opportunity to learn everything we do. We live We learn, not to get too Alanis Morissette on you here today, but we learn from what we, the mistakes we make and from everything. And so it begged the question for me, what have we learned over the last year? And this is something, by the way, if you hear really nothing else from me, I want you to answer that question for yourself. Okay, when you leave this place, I'm going to share with you some things that I think I've learned, and I, and I hope more of us can learn as well. But when you leave this place, you're probably going to go and have something to eat. You're probably going to be around some of your friends and your family. I want you to take a moment and start asking each other. You know, pastor said this. He was kind of crazy. He's off. But let's talk about what we have learned in a spiritual context. There's a lot of things that we think we've learned politically. Some people think we need more government. Some think we've learned that we need less government. Socially and culturally, some people think we need more racial politics. Some think we need less racial politics. I want to talk about the spiritual things, the spiritual lessons that I think are important that we can learn from this last year. Whether or not we ever commemorate March 11th or not, what have we learned I just clicked it. I didn't hold it down at all. I, I have a real problem. This is my little Achilles heel here. Let's me down. Look at that. Thank you guys for helping out back there. We got both Georges on the case. All right. First lesson. And, and this isn't in any necess- uh, particular order necessarily, but this one did strike me as kind of a primary one when I reflect upon this last year. We need spiritual eyesight. It is a curiosity and a concern to me that for most of the rhetoric, for most of the conversation, for most of the action activities that I see coming from people of faith, They have looked at this last year as primarily a a, a health issue, as primarily a science issue, as primarily a physical issue. And I know that that sounds natural and normal, and it is these things. Don't get me wrong. It certainly is a medical critical issue. But they also sometimes in the same vein, they say from, they, they, at least they, they may not say it in so many words, but by their actions and behaviors, they treat it as a fairly benign spiritual thing. As the, the spiritual side is somewhat secondary, the primary thing is the safety of our kids, the safety of the vulnerable, the safety of those you know, who need to avoid this. And, and I don't mean to, again, uh, belittle the health side of it, but friends, I'm telling you today, the devil created this problem. It is primarily and first and foremost a spiritual problem. The thing the devil hates the most in this world is the gospel. And it is the gospel that has suffered the most this last year. We need to get into our spiritual mindset and into our spiritual eyesight, our eyesight, excuse me, to understand that the first and primary uh, challenge of this has been the spiritual. And it changes your perspective when you wear that eyesight. You begin to look at the challenges. You begin to look at the solutions. You begin to look at the scenarios differently when you see it as primarily the devil keeping people from seeing Jesus Christ. This is a a tremendous lesson for me. And I think for the church today. 
How will we be successful in evangelizing and spreading the gospel of the world while we are dealing with a global pandemic? And I'm not in any ways trying to say that some of the restrictions or the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, you know, being careful and things like that were in any way wrong or not, you know, uh, uh, you know, that should have been ignored. But in the midst of that, there was a somewhat malaise among many Christians and organizations to simply say, we'll just wait until this is all over and see what happens. The devil is the originator of this. And we need to see it in that light. It is not a benign spiritual issue. It is a primary spiritual issue. And I'm not, I have a, a verse with, all, with these ones that I'm going to be sharing. I'm not going to necessarily read them all, but I wanted to read this one from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you can flip there quickly or you can follow along with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 to 16. I, just is so important to hear how this... Um, uh, is, is said here in the scriptures. Actually, I'm going to skip verse 9, uh, beginning in verse 10. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit, in my Bible, it's a capital S, so it's uh, the Holy Spirit. For through the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men know the thoughts of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Now this is very profound. I want you to see what Paul is saying here. He's saying you are the only person who knows your own thoughts. Right? That makes sense. He's using a very rational analogy here, right? You're the only person who knows your own thoughts. That's what he's saying here. Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the spirit of God. He says just like your spirit knows your thoughts, the spirit of God knows the thoughts of God. And now he says in verse 12, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit, is from, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know things freely given to us from God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. What Paul is saying is that when we have the Holy Spirit, we can understand the thoughts of God. We can actually see through the eyes of God when the Holy Spirit is directing us. But a natural man, verse 14 says, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him, and, can, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things. He's saying, you, if you have the Holy Spirit, you should be looking through the lens of the thoughts of God about all things. But you are praised by none. In other words, you should not worry about the judgment of others. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have, oh, we have the mind of Christ. I don't know about you, but that strikes me as very profound. We have the mind of Christ when his spirit dwells within him. We need to have spiritual eyesight. We need to look at the challenges of the past and the opportunities of the future through the lens of the mind of God and the spirit of God. And I believe we have uh, struggled with that in our, uh, in our past. And we want, we want to learn and we want to grow. And we want to learn how to use this. Can you, can you click forward for me? Item number two. By the way, some lessons are more reminders than they are like new knowledge, right? So a lot of these are not necessarily new, uh, but they are uh, uh, mostly uh, or, or could be considered reminders. Two, we are naturally selfish, okay? And I know you hear this a lot, and, and it's, it's nothing that super profound. And in a way, it's somewhat of an irony. When you think back to the rhetoric, when you think back to the, uh, the messaging of the past year, it seems very selfless, right? We just want everyone to be healthy, and we want everyone to be protected, and we want to protect the vulnerable, we want to protect the kids, and we want to protect the elderly. And by the way, again, I'm not mocking that. That's a sincere sentiment. But that, was a, that is a superficial uh, 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 sentiment in our culture because we have never been more divided and separate and divisive than we have been before. So while that sentiment is true, while that messaging is true, it is very superficial. Very superficial. You can't walk out your... I gotta calm down. 
I got to calm down. I, I'm, I'm a fairly, uh, I was going to say obnoxious. I'm, I'm, an, I'm a bit extroverted in some circumstances, you know, and I like to compliment people. I do. I like to compliment. You're in a restaurant, you know, hey, you look very nice today. Thank you for being, you know, oh, I like your shoes. Um, you know, oh, where'd you get that tie? I like to compliment people. And, uh, you know, maybe it's a bit cheesy at times and things like, I embarrass the kids and my wife sometimes, but I like to say nice things. I'm getting scared to say those things anymore. I'm getting scared to, to, to say something to someone because they might interpret it the wrong way and then all of a sudden you're in big trouble. You know what, I, am I alone in this? You know what I'm saying? Okay, um, I grew up playing sports, okay? I grew up playing sports, and when the, 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 you know, when the little guys uh, on the soccer field fall down and they hurt, you pick them up and you swat them on the bottom and say you're fine, right? No way. I'm not doing that. And again, I'm not meaning to belittle these things at all. I'm just saying we are walking on eggshells as a culture. We are walking on eggshells because we are naturally and inherently and woefully selfish. I don't mock the sentiment and the desire, and, and there has been many, many wonderful selfless aspects that have happened, but seeing how it's played out in our culture and in our world here recently, it just pounds in my head how when all things being equal, people are selfish. They are thinking of themselves first. I will do this for my own benefit, regardless of how it helps others. And of course, sir, you, we can debate all the different ways in which that may have been manifested. This next one is, of course, you know, again, it's a, a bumper sticker or something like that. But it's just been, again, just so clearly illustrated to me how much we need Jesus. How much we need Jesus, not in a general sense. I mean, uh, a lot of people, the Jews needed Jesus, and the Jews knew they needed Jesus, but they missed him because they'd created him in their own image. They had neglected the prophecies. They'd neglected the reality of who the Messiah was supposed to be, and they missed him. And I feel this same uh, 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 concern about myself and those I love. Are we really understanding the kind of Jesus that we need? And Jesus, when we understand our great need for him, he helps solve the first two, right? When we ask Jesus to really come into our lives, he corrects our vision and he heals that selfishness in us. And the more that we lack those things, the more it illustrates to me how much we, even, yes, us in the church, me, in my life, I need the Lord. I have gotten mad. I've gotten frustrated. I've gotten depressed. I've gotten confused. And there are times that it just reminds me how much I need Jesus. You know the text there from Revelation 3.17. Uh, uh, you know, I say that I am rich and am in need of nothing, um, but you do not know that you are poor, blind, wretched, and miserable. I counsel you to buy from me, I salve, that you may see. Right In the last days, Jesus tells us that many of us will not understand how much we need him. For, oh, we need each other. We need each other. Um, bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6, 2 says, and thereby fulfill the law of God. Bear one another's burdens. And we can all talk about, uh, you know, the isolation challenges that we've had over the last year and how that has impacted our culture. Um, a lot of this gets washed over in a, a, a lot of the broadcast news and all the politics and emotions. But the fact remains, the domestic violence is through the roof. Substance abuse right now is at levels people haven't seen. Suicide, suicidal behavior, and suicidal thoughts among children is at record highs. Self-harm is up 3,000% among teenagers right now. Okay? These are anecdotes. These are the realities of the trials and tribulations that we of a culture have had. And the church has an opportunity to be that place where we bear one another's burdens. We bear one another's burdens. And there are many ways we can do that. We can do it in our worship. We can do it in our small groups. We can do it with telephone calls and with Zoom and other things. But how much we need each other. Um, it's not good for man to be alone. We need each other. I know I'm going through these quickly, and 
just wanting to share these thoughts with you. This one, uh, um, from a prophetic standpoint, it strikes me. It is amazing how quickly this world mobilized against a perceived threat. You know how, div- you know how our world is quite divisive. I mean, uh, uh, Spain and France don't necessarily get along, right? Uh, and, and, and Norway and England aren't the best of friends. You know, and we could just go right down the list of all these communities and cultures that economically and politically and socially, they don't have a lot to get along on. They don't agree on a whole lot of things. But how quickly our world to a perceived threat and to a real threat rapidly became organized and found itself united against a common enemy. Now, again, I am not saying in any ways that that was wrong. I'm not saying that that was, uh, you know, ill-conceived. I'm just saying it is interesting how quickly this world, when it sees something it doesn't like, can rally around a common idea, and their day will come. Do you believe the Bible, friends? The day will come when the threat will not be coronavirus. The day will come when it's going to be you and me. And we can just see that portrayed in this, uh, in this experience that we've had over the last year. I do want to read this passage from Luke. Again, it's one you've probably heard many times and are familiar with. It's um, not Luke 23, it's Luke 21. Boy, I'm having all kinds of problems here. Luke 21, verses 34 through 36. A little typo there. Luke 21, verses 34 through 36. Be on guard so that your heart's will not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that day will not come upon you suddenly like a trap. There's two places in the Bible where the Greek word uh, that's used there for suddenly is used here and in 1 Thessalonians in the same context about the sensation that something suddenly has happened, that that day would come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things which are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, again, I want to say very clearly, I'm not saying that this uh, experience with the world and with the response to coronavirus is the Antichrist, okay? I'm not saying that that was, you know, the evil or anything like that, but it is an illustration. It's an illustration how out of the blue, when uh, enough people perceive a threat, they can organize themselves. And how interesting people that we've never heard of all of a sudden are setting policy and being revered as infallible. I'm not saying any names. It's just an interesting thing. Have we learned the lesson? Are we learning the lesson? And then the last one for you. Again, you've heard it before. This, this world is not our eternal home. Okay? And that doesn't mean we should neglect it. That doesn't mean we shouldn't care about our environment. That doesn't mean we should ignore the needy and the poor. That doesn't mean, you know, any of these things. But it means that we are not trying to transform this world into a utopia. We are trying to win people to Jesus Christ and prepare them for the next world. There are problems with our culture. There are problems with our government. There's problems with our church. There's problems in the family. There's problems in the community. And we need to be aware of those and and insert ourselves where we can provide healing and hope. But the ultimate goal, the ultimate reality is that this world is broken irreparably damaged by sin. And the hope of the world is Jesus Christ. The hope of the world is the second coming. The hope of the world is found in the gospel. And it's through the ministry of the church and the local Christian and the organizations like Good News TV that we can invite people to that reality and that understanding. Have we learned our lessons. What lessons have you learned this last year? What lessons are you learning from history? How are you seeing the scriptures fulfilled? How are you seeing the scriptures and the prophecies manifested? I encourage you to ask yourself that question. You have, you have yet to learn the great lesson of faith. 
When you surrender yourself entirely to God, when you fall all broken upon Jesus, you will then be rewarded, rewarded by a victory, the joy of which you have never yet experienced. As you review the past with a clear vision, you will see that at every time when life seemed to you only a perplexity and a burden, Jesus himself was near you, seeking to lead you into the light and through the darkness. <laughs> little little paraphrase there. Can you bump it ahead to the next one? I, I'm going to break it if I do touch it one more time. We need to go forward. We shall overcome. We shall. There should be one. There we go. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate your help. Your father was by your side, bending over you with unutterable love, afflicting you for your good as the refiner purifies the precious ore. When you have thought yourself forsaken, he was near you to comfort and sustain. We seldom view Jesus as he is and are never so ready to receive his help as he is to help us. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? That's from pamphlet 104, 1875. A few years ago, but still very relevant today. What lessons have you learned? And how is God helping you in your journey moving forward in 2021? Would you pray with me? Our precious Heavenly Father, I know that we could probably spend much more time going through... Uh, things that we've learned or areas of perplexity we're still struggling with, uh, anecdotes and illustrations of how your scriptures and how your promises are being fulfilled in our life. Father, I pray that this would not be a, a one-time exercise just here today, but that this would be a, an opportunity for everyone watching, everyone participating, everyone here to consider the simple uh, power of reflecting on the past, learning from it, and seeing how we can move forward. God, we need you. We need your spirit. We need your eyesight. Help your church to be faithful and strong even until the last. Be with, your, be with your people, Lord. Those who are struggling in real ways, economically, physically, with their health, those are real concerns. I don't mean to put them down at all, but help us to understand that this world is not our home and our ultimate goal is salvation in Jesus Christ and the gospel and uh, the salvation of those around us as well. We thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming today.